I've been tasked with uh, talking about uh, sort of forward-looking, uh, what, what is the brain atlas good for? What can we use it for? What can we learn from it? Um, and I, I just want to start by saying that the, uh, the first brain atlas is already done. It was done 100 years ago um, by the amazing um, <clears throat> founder of the field of neuroscience, um, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Um, and I, I'm starting with this uh, beautiful quotation of his, uh, which sort of sums up what we're trying to do. Um, and, and the key quote is that we're, we're studying the, the mysterious butterflies of the soul whose beating of wings may one day, day reveal to us the secrets of the mind. So the point of doing an atlas is to study these beautiful cells, but in the end to try to link them to the secrets of the mind, which are, as you know, uh, plentiful. So <clears throat> I try to organize this in, 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 in you know, different aspects that we can learn and, and use the Atlas for. Um, and I think uh, uh, it falls mainly in, in, in four main categories, um, uh, plus one very important side effect. Uh, the four categories are uh, laying a foundation for understanding human brain function, um, uh, human brain development, um, and human brain biological variation, and importantly, uh, understanding uh, mechanisms of human brain disease. And as a side effect of creating the Atlas and working with the Atlas, we'll also be creating um, a number of tools and, and data sets that will uh, greatly accelerate human brain science. So starting with function, um, this goes really right to the heart of, of the quote from, from uh, Ramon y Cajal, um, is the mystery of how the all the complexity of human thought, emotion, memory, and complex behaviors are generated by, uh, by the brain. So we know that they are generated by circuits, specific circuits that, that actually go across brain regions to, to work together to generate the behaviors that we, that we feel and observe. But we don't really know uh, much about how they work. And, and in support of the endeavor of finding out how brain circuits underlie uh, uh, human cognition and, and uh, behavior, the Atlas will provide a, a parts list, that's sort of the most fundamental contribution, a catalog of cell types. Sounds mundane, but without it, I think we're lost. Um, and secondly, a spatial atlas of cell types and states, uh, which allows us to, to place specific cell types in, in specific regions of the brain. And I think this is one, way, one um, aspect in which the brain is a bit different from other organs. Uh, most organs are spatially organized, obviously, but the brain is spatially organized in a particularly convoluted way. It doesn't have the repetitive or fractal structure of many other organs, and, and location really matters in the brain, both globally, of course, in terms of regions and you know, local uh, 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 brain nuclei, but also on the micro scale, how cells are located relative to each other, as in the retina, for example, where the specific tiling of specific cell types underlies the computational processing of images even before they reach the visual cortex. So we really need to know the spatial location of cell types on, on all of those scales. Um, and so the, the, you know, one of the major contributions of, of the ATLAS will be to have a, a coordinate framework for the whole brain that is uh, integrated with the data on cell types and, and their molecular properties. Um, we're lucky in the brain to have already a coordinate framework uh, as in a geometrical coordinate framework that, that tells us where things are um, in, in 3D space. And also an ontology that tells us what things are called. But that's still geometry and uh, we need to now integrate this with uh, the actual molecular composition, cell type and, and molecular composition uh, of all of these regions. And this is actually, by the way, going back to a question from a previous um, talk, one of the areas where I think other organ systems uh, could learn from what has been done in brain. The availability of a, of a, of a 3D coordinate framework um, with some gene expression or, or similar molecular properties on it is, is tremendously useful. And it's something that we have in the brain and are building to, um, to, to build up to the next uh, level. But it's actually completely lacking in most other organ systems. All right, armed with these things, there are a few things we can do. We can map behavior to cell types and connectivity. So having the atlas will uh, greatly accelerate our understanding of how behaviors are generated by specific cell types integrated in specific circuits. And, and of course, to study, study as a, um, uh, 
uh, as an integrated uh, system, the higher order um, spatial or circuit stru structure of the brain. So I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, this just to set the sort of fundamental uh, idea of what, what, the, what, the, what, the, what the kind of atlas we're building is, is all about. It's about two things. Um, first is um, to use uh, single cell methods. Um, our workhorse is single cell RNA sequencing. I think other techniques are coming along. Uh, so we'll complement it with protein or, or a chromatin state. But uh, for now, the most powerful method is the single cell RNA sequencing. So this results in, as you all know, a, a catalog of cell types that we try to organize in a sensible way, in a hierarchy or, or in, you know, uh, in, in something that we can work with and, and put names on. Um, and, and the second uh, stage is to take all of these cell types. This is a very abstract uh, concept, right? It's, it's, it's cell types defined by molecular properties. Um, uh, to identify cell, cell type markers and map those back to the, to the brain, to the spatial structure of the brain, and generate a spatial atlas of cell type distribution. Um, so the atlas would be both molecular properties of cell types, but also the spatial distribution of cell types, how they are located on a uh, large scale and small scale. And having that now gives us the ability to study uh, health and disease on the cell type level rather than, for example, uh, gene expression level. Um, <clears throat> so a few things that you can use the, this kind of atlas for um, it, it are, are to now link and use it as a scaffold to hang everything else on. So for instance, uh, we can measure morphology. And when the scientists say morphology, they don't just mean the shape of the cell. It's, it's really more the, the local connectivity, where cells project their axons, which layer they, they have their dendrites in, and so on. So it's morphology, it, it's, it informs us about the computational ability or, or gives us ideas of, of what the local circuits are doing. So we could measure, whoops, sorry. We could measure that um, and then uh, use our uh, set of markers that were defined by the atlas, uh, map that to the morphology. Now we can get identities for, for shapes, basically. So now we can assign identities to uh, cells with specific morphologies. Similarly, we can measure electrophysiology, and nowadays you can measure um, many cells at the same time, so you can actually measure small microcircuits and, and study local connectivity and feedback circuits and, and so on. Um, but you don't get cell identity from this. All the cells have the same color, um, and so you just get uh, sort of abstract connectivity between electrophysiology, electrophysiologically defined cell types. But by post hoc staining, uh, again with the markers defined by the atlas, we can now put uh, identities on the cells and we can say how different types of cells are connected to each other. Um, and you can scale this up to, uh, um, there are now beautiful experiments uh, going on in, in, in many labs where you can actually monitor activity of cells in the brain in behaving animals. Uh, and, and, and similarly, you could do this in, uh, in, for example, organoids or in, as you saw in the previous talk, or in uh, human slice cultures. And again, this gives you the, uh, the local activity of, of cells, um, um, but it does, doesn't give you identities. Uh, but by mapping identities onto such an experiment, you now have the identities, and you can as assign those to, uh, to uh, properties, uh, functional properties of the cells. Now, one very key aspect of this is that the, the atlas is one integrated thing. So identities that you uh, assign in this experiment uh, can be transferred to identi identities uh, uh, defined in this experiment. So you now beginning to integrate all of these functional properties of cells, assigning them to cell types where they can be sort of brought together and we can begin to get a, a larger understanding of how neuronal circuits um, work. So the second aspect is human brain development. Um, and uh, I, I think this, it, it's very important not to forget that probably most of the cell types or states that we're going to discover uh, are, are going to be during development. Developing, development of a complex organ like the brain is an incredibly complex process to, that requires precise positioning of cell types in precise locations, and, and then they have to be wired together. And, uh, and, and this is uh, really a mysterious process, and, uh, and we have uh, ongoing studies in many labs in particular uh, regions, but really having a, a reference atlas that brings together all of this uh, information uh, I think will be incredibly important. So the atlas, I think, can contribute a couple of things. Um, one is to, uh, to um, define, uh, let's say, uh, or um, reveal 
uh, the lineage tree of brain development and the cell state manifold. I'm going to try to define those concepts on the next slide. But basically the sequence of states that cells go through as they differentiate towards um, adult terminal fates. Um, and it's going to mean that we have to introduce a, a new axis to the uh, spatial atlas. We want to have a spatial atlas, but it's going to have to be four-dimensional. Somehow we need to have um, an aspect of time in our atlases. Uh, so that we can see how things develop over time. And we need to connect one time point to the next so that we understand lineages and, uh, and fates. Um, as a benefit now, uh, we're going to be able to map uh, properties to specific stages of uh, brain development, specific cell types that go through a specific state at a particular time during development. And this will give us tools now to, to test hypotheses on brain development, to induce or repress certain fates or, or to fix uh, uh, problems of cell migration and, and things like that. Um, and I think uh, it, it's uh, incredibly exciting that uh, the great advances in single cell methods um, are being merged with the great advances in, in image-based methods and, and live, live microscopy. And, and, and I think this points to, towards a future where we can really derive quantitative models of how even complex organs like the brain develop. Um, so, um, I just want to define, so there is a lot of work ongoing to map lineage trees, and there's a confusion about what that really means uh, uh, frequently. Um, and, and so I think we need to keep in mind that we have two very different things in mind when we say lineage trees. Uh, a cell division lineage tree, uh, uh, which is shown here on the right, is, is really the tree, the physical tree of cell division um, that uh, cells go through. And this is going to be individual, this will be different for every brain. We're getting increasingly powerful methods to trace such lineages, and they can give uh, a lot of information about, for example, um, proliferation and, and, uh, and the ancestry of, of uh, uh, neurons in particular brain regions. Uh, but there will not be one lineage tree that explains the brain. It's going to have to be an individual thing. On the other hand, I, I think there is another kind of tree, or, or maybe uh, uh, just a map, um, that is the map of, of states that cells go through as they differentiate. So this is actually a map of hippocampus development where you have stem cells down here, the radial glia, that can um, uh, decide to either become astrocytes, um, differentiated down here to the red uh, part of the manifold, or oligodendrocytes going here to the, to the violet part. Or they can uh, make a completely different choice to uh, 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 differentiate into immature neurons that then mature into one of several kinds of mature neuronal types. And this is, uh, I think, likely to be a single uh, 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 map that, that is valid for, for all of the brain, all of human brain, uh, at least a single reference map. And I think we should uh, make um, uh, uh, our best efforts to, to really discover this map. Um, once you have such a map, you can then ask, for example, what are the regulators that are induced at this moment when a cell is making the decision to go to take a right or a left on this, on this manifold? And that can inform functional experiments. Um, so if we have a map um, of the molecular states, uh, I think there, as I said, there are now increasingly powerful microscopy methods to really follow, monitor, uh, embryo, em, em, embryo development in real time um, and really monitor the behavior of all the individual cells. So this is a beautiful movie. Uh, I'm not brave enough to put movies on my slides, so I put it as, as individual pictures here. But um, it, it's really a beautiful movie of the early uh, stages of, of uh, embry embryogenesis, and you can see the, the neural tube being formed. Uh, and, and it has cellular resolution. Uh, it really has temporal resolution sufficient to monitor the migration of cells or the, the division of cells. But it doesn't have, again, cellular identities. And I, I think here is where the cell atlas can come in and, and provide a reference that you can map onto such a, a, a 3D view uh, to begin to understand how the brain develops. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, next aspect, I think, is human brain variation. This is going to be a huge challenge uh, because the brain is already complex enough that it's an enormous challenge to just uh, uh, map one brain. But it's clear that the human brain uh, shows um, important variation. Uh, and I would highlight uh, two particular aspects. One is uh, sexual dimorphism. You already saw an example of this earlier today. 
uh, in brain cell type composition, it's clear that many behaviors are sexually dimorphic and there are many diseases and, and other conditions that are sexually dimorphic that have their origin in the brain. So I think understanding that will be incredibly important. And the other uh, highlight would be uh, aging. And again, we, we of course know that we're all subject to the deterioration of our minds as we get older and to understand this process and ideally come up with ways of preventing it, uh, I think is going to be one of the major outcomes of, uh, of a project like this. So I uh, just want to highlight uh, the many conditions that have really profound societal consequences that are sexually dimorphic and are rooted in the brain. Um, so there are many uh, dis disorders of the brain, um, both uh, actually particularly developmental disorders uh, that are dimorphic and, and have a not, not massive but still very significant um, bias towards one sex or the other. Um, in addition, there are more sort of, let's say, normal behaviors that are slanted towards uh, uh, one or the other sex and, and in their extreme cause a lot of um, uh, grief in society. For example, violent crime, which is 10 times more common in males, and, and sex crime is even, even worse. And, and, and so understanding the origin of, of, uh, of these uh, differences, whether uh, whether localized in the brain or, or as a consequence of the development of the brain or the environment during development, I think will be very important. Um, it's actually a slide from John Marioni's uh, lab uh, showing um, uh, an interesting aspect of brain development, uh, sorry, brain aging, um, where it seems that as the brain grows, uh, grows older, uh, sorry, this is not brain, uh, but the, of, of gene expression, as, as, as cells grow older, um, the, it seems that they are maintaining uh, gene expression at, at, the, uh, you know, at the intended level, but the variability of gene expression increases. So there is kind of a loss of control. Um, so that brings us to human brain disease. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the final major aspect, I think, is, is the, the, the purpose of the ATLAS is to, uh, um, uh, to inform our understanding of mechanisms of human brain disease and, and how diseases are related to cell types. Um, so having an atlas will allow us to map, for example, genetic understanding of disease, the, the genes associated with disease, to cell types in space and in time, and to model disease using organoids and, and being able to compare organoids with uh, sort of the, the ground truth. Um, so here's one example from Ido Amit's lab. Uh, this is a model uh, system of Alzheimer's or an Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, model in mouse, uh, where they discovered a, a specific type of microglia activated um, in Alzheimer's and actually located around the plaques in Alzheimer's, um, and, and whose jobs it, it seems to be to um, eat up the plaques that, uh, that are uh, part of the mechanism of the disease. Um, uh, another example, this is schizophrenia. This is from Jens Jerling Leffler's lab, um, where I've also been involved. Uh, is to take uh, uh, genes involved in, in a disease as defined by genome-wide association studies and now try to map them to cell types in order to understand better the site uh, of the disease and, and ultimately the mechanism. And the final example is our developmental atlas in particular, uh, as I said, will inform, will give us clues as to the, the genes that are, 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 are uh, involved in specifying specific cell types, and this will give us tools to now understand how to purposely create cell types in the particular, in the specific uh, region of the brain where, where something has gone wrong in, in a disease. So this work from Ernest Arena's lab, where they have uh, used um, a specific, a specific, specific uh, collection of genes to induce uh, a tr transformation of astrocytes into dopaminergic neurons. So this is a, a potential gene therapy for Parkinson's disease where you would inject a, a cocktail of, for example, viruses expressing particular genes to transform a subset of astrocytes in the striatum into dopaminergic neurons that could uh, supplant the missing dopamine in, in these patients. I think that was the last slide. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Up front here, Sarah. 
Yeah, that, that was a beautiful overview, Stan, and um, you know, sort of global conceptual framework, which is really helpful. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the, the link between you know, the molecular uh, signature of the isolated cells, the cell circuitry, the tissue, and then to behavior in human? You know, how far can we get? Basically, we, we, can, we can do the molecular descriptive kind of characterization, build the cell atlas. You know, we can do functional studies in things like organoids and organic typic cultures. But then the behavioral you know, experiments, the, you know, what you showed was all mouse. Will we ever be able to kind of you know, make that connection in human? Yeah, what no, are your so thoughts? This, this is, of course, that's a main limitation of, of brain research, that it's, it's, again, very hard to measure things in intact living brains. So <laughs> there are, um, uh, you know, you can do uh, imaging using non-invasive imaging, uh, but it, it only gets you so far. And I think uh, for the foreseeable future, it will be still very important to, to work with model organisms. Um, and, and mouse is, is maybe the most minimal at, at the moment, but I think also non-human primates or, or uh, monkeys uh, will be uh, equally important. And I hope that there will be a parallel effort to make a brain atlas for, uh, for one such species that, that can be uh, serve as a reference for behavioral science. How are you? Um, I was wondering if you could just kind of give your opinion or the opinion in the field as to specifically in the brain whether it's possible to definitively discretize cell types as they relate to these features as well. Is there going to be a finite set of cell types or continuous properties that we're also going to have to map onto behavior, electrophysiology, et cetera? Uh, you'll get a different answer from other people, but uh, everybody uh, uh, sort of thinking about this question, I think, grapples with this and uh, whether, you know, discreteness versus continuity. Uh, my opinion is that uh, we will not be able to find a, a final catalog of cell types. I think what we're looking at is a landscape that we can map with uh, increasingly high resolution. Um, and it's going to vary along multiple axes at the same time, some of which we can call cell identity but some of which will be uh, cell activity or activation. Um, like the microglia that, uh, that uh, I showed there, those are really not, I would say, a different cell type, but they're being activated. So there's, there's like a sub-program of the genome that's being activated to do a particular task. And that's going to be the same in neurons, for example. After electrical activity, there is a program that gets induced, and, and then, then, it, you know, then it's shut off. So it's, a, it's really a machinery that we're observing, and we're seeing the shadows projected by this machinery as it's operating. And is this an expectation that it's unique to the brain, or are we going to see similar phenomenon in other tissues? And is the human cell atlas developing a framework to look at continuity property, or you know, continuous properties versus discrete features of cell types? Yes. I mean, in any tissue, uh, when you go to development, it's going to be, by definition, con <laughs> continuous in, in some way. I mean, there will be a, a there is uh, a sequence of states, trans transcript storm, storm state or molecular states more broadly, that connects the, the zygote to all of the cell types in the body. So that is going to be some sort of tree, maybe with some shortcuts, and this is the thing that we're mapping. And, and uh, I, you know, I can't say that we have the tools ready today. I mean, not, it's clustering and, and defining cell types and giving them names is a very useful way of organizing the data. But it, I, in my opinion, it's not the real thing. The real thing is this, the, this map of cell states that we need to map with um, as high resolution as we can. All right, last question, quick question for Gerson. Super short follow-up on that, really exciting. In the analysis working group, we are discussing how to annotate things, right? And essentially, we'll be doing annotation of clusters. Do you think in the future, we should be actually really getting people to annotate us lineages, gradients, or potentially even those axes that you mentioned before? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think uh, even on a lineage, like, even if it's a connected thing that's branching off, and you know, it's still useful to chop this up into pieces and give those pieces names. And as long as you don't confuse this with, with the underlying reality, it, it's still um, extremely useful for all kinds of analysis. And, and we can't think if we don't give things names. Uh, so we need, we need to do that. Yeah. All right, let's thank Stan once again. <laughs>